the deaths um, that we've had over the last week. Uh, my, my father died this week um, under avoidable circumstances related to the failings in our long-term care system. Um, I also want to acknowledge the death of Chantal Moore, the death of Chantal Moore yesterday in New Brunswick at the hands of the police who were sent to help her. Um, and I also <clears throat> want to acknowledge uh, the, the deaths of uh, George Floyd and of Regis uh, Korshinsky Peke. Um, we don't have all the details about Regis's death, but we also know that in her case as well, the police were sent to help her and that's not what happened. So if we could just have a, um, a short moment of silence and, and recognition of all of their passings. Thank you. And I also wanted to acknowledge that we had two other team members who lost uh, very close family members this week as well. Victoria, who's hosting the meeting, lost her uncle um, less than two weeks ago, just around, just within a few days of my father. And um, we have another team member who lost an uncle. So there is so much uh, death and, uh, and tragedy at, at the moment. I know it's touching so many of us. Um, and it makes it that all the more important to me that we get uh, together, that we talk, that we talk about what comes next and how we're going to, uh, how we're going to do better, how we're going to do better on behalf of, of the people that we love, uh, but also on behalf of even those that we don't know. And so I, I've been going on this week exactly because of that, because I know it's the best thing that I can do for my, uh, my father and my family at this moment. Um, I feel a lot of, and I'm sure Elizabeth does as well, you know, we picked this topic many, many weeks ago, many weeks ago. Uh, it's really not opportunistic at all. We, we had decided on this a long time ago because we, we knew that it was something that we should be talking about as a party. We knew that it had to be part of discussions about the green recovery. Uh, and we also, you know, when we were thinking of regions and what people in particular regions of the country would want to hear about, we knew, um, particularly those members of, of our team who, are, who live in BC, and we have a lot of team members who live in BC, uh, they knew that you, um, you would want to talk about this and hear about it, and it's something that you care a lot about. So it's very topical, um, it's very timely, but it was something we chose a long time ago, and I do feel quite a lot of responsibility, I'm sure Elizabeth does too, in guiding the discussion. And I hope that um, we can do, do honor to it in, in the short time that we have. If you see me looking at notes, it's because I have, I have some and I, I want to refer to them from time to time just to make sure that I'm covering some things that I think are very important. Uh, first, um, you know, we, we picked this topic because we, we understand, you know, I understand, um, the Green Party understands, the evidence demonstrates that there is a deficit of indig Indigenous and racial um, justice in Canada. There is no question about that. It's also really important to understand, and I have spent a lot of time, and our campaign has spent a lot of time this week on social media in particular, writing about and bringing attention to the fact that the injustice uh, applies most particularly to Blacks and Indigenous peoples. That is not to say that it doesn't apply to other, to other racialized groups, but there is no question from the evidence that there is a specific anti-Black and a specific anti-Indigenous uh, racism in this country. It's systemic and endemic, and uh, we have not wrapped our, our, ourselves around it at all. So whether we're looking at criminal justice, whether we're looking at education, life expectancy, healthcare outcomes, employment, we, um, we tend to be the two groups that have the, the, the worst outcomes. Uh, and so I want to, because of the events of the last week in particular, um, the events of yesterday with Chantel and um, 
earlier this this week with um, with uh, George um, Floyd down in the states. I do want to um, just give you a sense of some of these statistics because I think it's really important to understand, particularly again as an evidence based party, um, that there is no exaggerating uh, what what we are confronting here. So in terms of deadly force. Uh, and I'm going to refer to all our country and the United States uh, because people tend to think that there's a significant difference in terms of, of uh, rela uh, relationships between our criminal justice system, for instance, here and uh, in the States, and it's just simply not the case. In the case of Black Americans, uh, Black Americans are two and a half times more likely to be killed by police than whites. In Canada, Indigenous peoples were one third of the people shot and killed by the RCMP within the 10 year period of 2000 to 2017. And in Canada, uh, we, we don't have the national statistics because the, the uh, government does not collect them at any level, but we do know from the research of the CBC and others that 36, uh, almost 37% of um, Toronto police fatalities uh, were black, Can black residents of Toronto, uh, even though black Canadians only represent 8.3% of the, the residents. And when we look at incarceration, the story continues. Black Americans are 12% of the US population, but 33% of prisoners. Black Canadians are 3% of the population, but 10% of prisoners. And until uh, very recently, Black Canadians were the fastest growing segment of the prison population. Indigenous peoples are 4% of the adult population, but 30% of the prisoners. And when you look at provinces like Manitoba and Saskatchewan, while they do have a larger Indigenous population, it, there's still a, a gross overrepresentation of Indigenous adults in, in the prison population. Indigenous adults are 75% of prisoners in Manitoba, 75% and 74% in Saskatchewan. Uh, and this has, this has been the case for a long time. Indigenous women, Indigenous women are 42% of all female prisoners at the provincial and federal level. Uh, there has been a 52% increase in the number of, of the, in the number of indigenous inmates, uh, this uh, I want to stress is in the context of a Supreme Court ruling from 1999 that instructed judges to consider all alternatives, all other alternatives first to a um, to incarceration, um, to a custodial sentence before before selecting that. And despite that, we see this increase. And so this is, this, is, this is real, and you can see that our statistics uh, for Black people and Indigenous peoples are, are as bad, and in the case of Indigenous peoples, worse than the United States. Uh, and so we, we have to, we, we, there are no pats on the back that we can give ourselves in this regard. We have the same crisis here as they do in the States, we just don't have the same uh, news coverage. We just don't have the same media core. And so when we talk about a green recovery and when we talk about indigenous peoples and, uh, and, uh, and racialized people and particularly black people in the context of a green recovery, we have to keep in mind that the climate emergency is racialized as well. There is a, there is a huge element of the climate emergency that is racialized. Around the world, indigenous racialized communities suffer from environmental catastrophes first and worse. And again, if, if there is any sense that I'm exaggerating, it's important to, to keep in mind that um, in, within the last six months, the United Nations has warned about a looming, what they call, these are their words and not mine, a looming climate apartheid, um, which they describe as, as a moment when uh, Western and particularly, um, you know, Western nations um, in particular uh, and wealthy people within those nations will be able to insulate themselves from the worst impacts of the climate emergency, whereas poor people and, and countries, you know, where poor people are, uh, people of color rather, are the majority will not be able to. 
So there is a, there is a significant uh, racialized element that we have to acknowledge. And we have to acknowledge that there cannot be, and there must not be, any climate justice that does not include social justice and racial justice. Uh, in the context of Canada, beyond the, the, the global climate emergency, we also need to keep in mind uh, the, the, very, you know, the, the very specific environmental racism that happens, um, that's happening now, that happens each and every day, and that uh, many Indigenous peoples and Black, uh, Black Canadians in particular continue to live under. Um, we, we, when we talk about environmental racism, for those, uh, for those who, don't, uh, who don't know, uh, environmental racism is defined as the disproportionate location of toxic and hazardous, hazardous facilities uh, within Black uh, and Indigenous communities and communities of the working poor. And so we, I sent out today, for those of you who are on social media, I sent out uh, a uh, a tweet today that uh, with a map from the Enrich project, which is a project that's being led by Ingrid Waldron out in, in Nova Scotia, that shows just within the context of, of Nova Scotia uh, exactly what that means and, and just how serious it is. And so this is the case in, in many, many, um, many, many communities across the country. And of course, when we think about um, the pipeline projects that are continuing unabated, even in the face of COVID, uh, and, uh, and the risk that it's posing to Indigenous uh, communities around across the country, and particularly out in, um, in BC, uh, we, we remember that there, is a, there, is, there are things that we are willing to do in communities that are, are Black and communities that are Indigenous, uh, that we just simply would not tolerate in, in, other, in other communities. And so what, what can be done? What can, what can allies do uh, in the context of the, of the climate emergency and in terms of the green recovery? One thing that we absolutely can do, just as a general principle, uh, we can continue to, to be very, very vigilant in searching for all of the places where policies uh, occur at the intersection between race and the environment. And some of these, uh, you know, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not sexy. They're, 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 they seem modest, but they make a tremendous difference. When the Green Party has talked about uh, rural transportation, we talk about it in the context of the climate emergency and the need to move away from cars, but at the same time, we are also talking about it in the context of the missing and um, murdered Indigenous um, women and girls report that, re that uh, acknowledged and identified this as a primary, um, a primary concern and, and one of the risk factors uh, in, in terms of, in terms of um, Indigenous um, women and girls and their safety and two-spirited people and their safety. Uh, we also, when we talk about investments in public transportation, it's racialized communities that use public transportation the most, that depend upon it the most, and that uh, we have a real justice issue when we talk about access to public um, uh, transportation at affordable prices, while at the same time we know that that is absolutely going to be one of the keys to tackling the climate emergency. Uh, and then when we talk about Indigenous title, that is absolutely an issue of Indigenous justice. At the same time, it is an issue that, um, that impacts our, our ability to succeed uh, in tackling the climate emergency and protecting our biodiversity because 80% of our biodiversity is located in the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples around the world. And so there are many points of intersection. Uh, we need to find them, we need to uh, make people aware of them, and we need to champion policies um, that, uh, that address them. And then finally, in terms of the the in terms of racial justice, again, just in the context of the this moment in time, which we cannot look away from, and we should not look away from. Uh, what can we do here in Canada when we're talking about racial justice? First, I would encourage everyone who has not had an opportunity to do so yet to read the report of the United Nations Working Group on people of African descent, uh, the report that they produce after their visit to Canada, 
the report is about two and a half years old now, so not very old at all. It has a series of conclusions and rec recommendations that are really eye-opening, really, really eye-opening, uh, and, and provide, I think, a very reasonable and, uh, and fairly comprehensive roadmap about what Canada can do now, what it can do immediately, um, and in the medium and long term in order to make a significant um, um, step forward in terms of uh, justice for, for, um, for black, uh, black Canadians. Uh, one of the things that we have been pushing uh, in our campaign, we, we, we launched a, a petition online for it this week and we're going to continue to try to draw attention to the fact um, that we have no national database on the police use of force, period. Never mind one that includes race-based statistics. We have no national database that allows um, people in Canada to track the use of force by police unless it results in, in charges. Um, we just don't know, and, uh, and that has to end. Um, we also need to disaggregate our data. You know, this, this is, we, we don't want communities of color uh, being pitted one against the other. But when we're lumped into the monolith of, of visible minority or racial minority in terms of gathering uh, national statistics, that is exactly what happens. And as we know, there are significant disparities between races. We have got to disaggregate that data so that we can have a truly accurate picture of the outcomes for various um, uh, racialized groups within Canadian society. And we have got to make space, as Jesse said, we have got to make space, uh, those, of us who wish to, those, of, um, those of us who wish to be allies, we have got to make space for leadership roles, um, for, we, for leadership roles uh, for people from these communities in, in politics. Because we've seen again this week that diverse representation does matter. It does matter in terms of what we say uh, to people. It matters in terms of perspective. Uh, and, and it's something that we need to encourage. And so I'm going to uh, leave it there. This is the longest I've ever spoken in one of our, our town halls with Elizabeth. Um, but uh, I'm going to pass it to her and I'm going to thank her very much for being here with us to speak about this. Elizabeth, you know, she was, for instance, uh, the person who seconded uh, the motion um, with, to, to bring forward a bill uh, to acknowledge environmental racism. And uh, it, it didn't succeed that time, but it will. And it's not at all a surprise that Elizabeth was the one to second that. And so I'm going to pass it to her to let her lead us in, uh, lead us in a discussion. Uh, I do want to say for myself, Elizabeth is only with us until, um, um, until the end of the hour, but I'm going to stay on for another half hour after that if anyone would like to continue the discussion about specifically about uh, indigenous and racial justice in terms of the uh, in terms of the green recovery or if people would like to speak about the events of, of the week. So please know that um, that will happen uh, after, you know, after our fundraiser at the end. So let me pass it to you, Elizabeth. Okay, thank you. And Amy, um, forgive me, if I don't do this bit of housekeeping, I'm going to forget, which is that I need to explain again, we usually do at the beginning, that I'm, I've been asked by the leadership committee to do fundraising events. I don't think it's the best solution, by the way, to the question of how the Green Party promotes candidates that we call either from equity seeking groups or to improve the diversity of the party. But the party asked me to do two things. They asked me to stay neutral in the campaign. And then they said, well, okay, we want you to fundraise and help the fundraising, particularly for candidates facing a steeper hurdle coming from uh, groups that are underrepresented in our society. Um, it's a joy to fundraise for you, Annamie, and work with you. And these discussions we've had, uh, it's you know a virtual, it's not really a, a tour tour, it's a virtual set of Zoom meetings. It sounded more exotic as a tour, but I am doing them for other candidates as well. It's within the context of the leadership rules. I just want to assure everybody of that. And, uh, but I find them particular, this has been so helpful for me because I can't remember what day we started all this, but it was well before George Floyd's murder. I can't, as like you, Annamy, I cannot get over the fact that we planned tonight of all nights for this conversation. 
I need this conversation um, and I think a lot of us need to find ways to grieve and share. I just wanted before launching into more points, um, you mentioned right away at the top of the murder of, well, the killing of Chantal Moore in New Brunswick. But um, since it's a BC call, I want everybody to know that, um, that she was from, she's part of the Klako Kwe At, uh, which gets a, sort of, we, you know, the anglicized, we'd say Klaquit, a First Nation. She was living in Port Alberni. She was living near Tofino. Uh, she, it's just such a small world. Her family is close friends with a uh, former Green Party candidate and a wonderful Indigenous leader, Brenda Sayers. Um, Brenda's Judah Sayers' sister. Some of you will remember that Brenda ran in 2015. But before that, it was Brenda Sayers that led the charge against the Canada China um, FIPA. Long stories, but the, the, the Bill Erasmus is in that family, Judas Sayers, Nate, uh, Brenda, and so on. And, and we're in a situation where we're so close to that, and it is um, it will require uh, a significant amount of investigation to figure out how a 26-year-old mom and daughter at one o'clock in the morning was shot five times outside her home by a policeman doing a wellness check. I've, I've never heard a minister of, at any level of a cabinet, express such honest, raw rage as Mark Miller did today as Minister for Indigenous Services. Yeah, exactly, Megan, thank you. Yeah, Brenda ran in North Island, Powell River. Uh, she's, um, and she, it's, it's, by the way, Brenda Sayers has started the GoFundMe campaign. You can find the link um, on my Twitter feed to raise money for Chantal Moore's family. There's need for money for travel to New Brunswick, funeral expenses, and of course she has a five-year-old daughter. So there's, there's going to be, it's important. Um, I was uh, able to be uh, in Ottawa this, well, I'll be in Ottawa. I arrived on Monday night and I have to say, you know, every time I have to travel to Ottawa for work, I feel like I'm risking my life. I felt like it was worth it when I got to speak to these issues of racism, police brutality, um, the, the killing of the disproportionate killing of black people across the United States. You can find my speech online. It's on YouTube. So I don't, I won't regurgitate. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I, I identified yes, anti-black racism. Yes. Black lives matter. Indigenous Lives Matter, anti-Asian racism is rising, anti-Semitism is rising. And personally, and I said this in my speech, so I want to flag it for all of us and then open it up to conversation. And the Greens are the only people who've been flagging this. I'm deeply concerned that white supremacist organized groups are on the rise, that it is a form of domestic terrorism. It's in the United States for sure, and it's in Canada. CSIS has identified that there was a rise in white supremacist organizations. We got a, a, a bit of it when the three naval, was it three naval officers, friends from Nova Scotia will help me remember, but the so-called Proud Boys who uh, protested against the Mi'kmaq protesters who were standing up against the veneration of colonial powers who slaughtered Mi'kmaq people. So it's a there's a there's a moment here where I think it's got to be more than okay. In addition to all the enormous amount of firepower that we give the police, we're going to make them wear a body cam. That's not enough for me now. I I think we really need, and we called for it this week in a in a press release, a full investigation of whether white supremacist groups are targeting, joining, and infiltrating police forces and our military, and we need to know. Uh, the, what's happening in the United States looks to me like it's pretty, it pretty much looks like um, a movement that's been laying the seeds and growing for some time. Uh, the fact that over a hundred um, journalists have been fired upon by the police over a four day period in the US um, obviously, Donald Trump is fomenting this. He's been giving oxygen to white supremacists for years. I've been watching it, and I know a lot of you have. Well, every time Donald Trump says something like, um, CNN reporters are bad people, right? It, yeah, I've been thinking it, it'll be a miracle if, if a journalist isn't killed because somebody who loves Donald Trump decides that he's going to go do Donald Trump a favor and kill a reporter. 
but the killing of black people through the United States and Canada, the, uh, the, the harassment and the racism uh, is, is getting a, light, a bit of a light on it that we often don't see. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw, uh, she's a friend of mine, the former Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, Marianne Francis, who's black, talking about how to this day when she goes into a store, people follow her around. She says, now in COVID, they look, you know, oh, now she's a black woman in a mask. We really ought to follow her around. Um, Ahmed Hussein, who's uh, the member of Parliament for Edmonton and the cabinet member responsible for um, uh, family and social services, et cetera, he posted uh, uh, his experience of being followed, of being viewed suspiciously, and of his three black boys being treated uh, differently. He said, you know, you could just see the little signals like, as, as his children go into a store or, or, or public space, a, a white woman will pull her purse a little closer to herself. And then there was that wonderful teacher in Regina, beautiful young um, black teacher who saw that on Facebook, his neighbor had posted a picture of him getting into his own car in front of his own house with the, the tag, be careful. I think if it wasn't for the murder of George Floyd, that wonderful school teacher in Regina would have kept that little story to himself, but he went public with it. it it's, this is what we're facing. We really need to talk about it. We need to talk about it and we don't need to make it just be one more period of, of, of uh, obviously as, a, as, a, as Jesse said, opening up, he's a, he's a white man, I'm a, you know, a white woman and you, you've got to deal with it. You know, you have to know that by just by the color of our skin, we've got privilege. We're going to do better in a job application. We're going to have a better chance at everything because we don't, we, we've got privilege. And, and it took me a while to figure out how big that was. And we need to examine our privilege and we need to use our privilege to be good allies. And that's, that's the challenge of where we are. And um, we're trying in the, and in the Greens, for sure we are working towards the post-pandemic vision of what we think we should be doing. That was the theme of what Anami and I thought we would do with this series of opportunities to talk with other Greens, which is the part that I think is, is absolutely phenomenal about this and I look forward to doing it with other candidates. It's a conversation. We're in a national conversation. I can let you in on a bit of a, a, a embargoed news. It's not, not, it'll be Tuesday at this point that, that Paul Manley and Jenica Atwin and I with Joanne Roberts release the kind of, it's not quite a manifesto, but a, a bit of a vision of what we want to see in resilience and recovery and what comes next. But we know it, we're not going to go back to normal. Normal was not good. Normal was not a good place to be. Normal accepted unacceptable degrees of inequality, unacceptable and racism. There's no level of racism that's acceptable. And it accepted the idea that uh, we could keep polluting while we could only do incremental things to respond to the climate emergency. No, that's, that's very different. So I'm, I, I think you'll like what you see on Tuesday, but deeply embedded in that are issues of justice and um, justice for indigenous peoples in Canada. And I also like to sometimes reflect on, uh, you use the turn of phrase, we use it a lot, enemy of, you know, that indigenous peoples are overrepresented in our prisons and black people are overrepresented in our prisons. I just wanna flag that rich white men are vastly underrepresented in our prisons. And uh, there's a place for them, the people that I think that own the private care homes that cut corners so they could make more profits, make more dividends. There may be criminal charges at the end of the day for some of those uh, CEOs delivering dividends to shareholders. We must never, ever, ever accept the idea that long-term care for seniors or people with disabilities should be a for-profit operation that's outside the Canada Health Act. So we have a lot of work to do coming out of pandemic. Um, we're nowhere near ready. I so worry for all the demonstrations. I see those beautiful demonstrations and I just hope and pray that the people who are on the streets against the violence and the racism of, of, of both countries that we will, we will see the, those um, that are our brothers and sisters who are protesting, and I know a lot of us are too, keep, be careful, keep the physical distance uh, and, and avoid 
uh, as, as best we possibly can uh, the COVID-19 virus. But it is interesting, again, as an aspect of, of racism, how much more the death toll rises among uh, the Black population and, of course, in seniors. And there's an element of, I, I think there's an element of racism in Trump saying we can reopen the economy because those aren't the people he cares about. Yeah. I mean, I just have a couple of observations. I can tell, say already again, I I will certainly be staying because I can see that there are things that people would, would like to stay, say. Um, and we definitely are keeping all of all of these uh, these comments. Um, I, I know that we won't won't get to everything, but I hope everyone has their chat box open so that they can see what others are, are saying um, while while the conversation is is going on. Uh, but you know. I don't know about all of you, but I am very, very fed up with these expressions of, of shock and horror and we must do better and we can do better and we will do better. I heard the, um, the prime minister's um, press scrum today and uh, there was not one concrete thing. All of these, all of the things that we know we should be doing um, we have known for some time, and the, the United Nations report, um, which is which was which was released uh, during the last Parliament, and is very very detailed. Uh, we have not we haven't done any of that. This is so. This is not it's not complex. It's not you know difficult. It's not it's a question of priorities, uh, and we just simply are not priority prioritizing this. And in some cases, we have leaders who don't believe that there is a problem at all. You know, in, in my province, I'm in Ontario, our premier said just a couple of days ago, you know, thank God that we don't have these systemic problems here. So, you know, we, um, we, we have people who aren't even at the beginning, but then we do have people who are saying all the right things, or it's all of the usual platitudes, and there is simply no action at all. And I believe that the time is, is way overdue for uh, people in Canada to just be selecting different kinds of leaders. These leaders do not have the, um, the priorities, uh, the, the commitment to these priorities. Where is the missing and murdered, um, missing and murdered uh, women and indigenous girls action plan? Where is it? It was supposed to have arrived um, shortly with, by June, it was promised. Um, it's not there. And at the same time that it's not there, uh, we had an action plan that was, was conceived of and delivered and implemented out in Alberta to rescue um, the, uh, the fossil fuel sector in the same amount of time and for far less money. And so, you know, we have to, we can't keep electing the same people and expecting different results. And we also have to accept in the, in the context of the climate emergency that if there wasn't such a uh, racialized element to it, if it wasn't going to disproportionately affect developing countries and countries where um, people of color live, um, and if there wasn't still the, 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 the crazy, you know, I mean, it's the absolutely ridiculous and absurd hope, but still belief that um, wealthy people can shelter themselves from the worst impacts of the climate emergency, then we would already have been acting. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is something that we have to, we, we, it's not just impacting the people that, um, that you know, that have, let's say, the, the closest um, relationship with these issues. It's impacting us all and it's impacting our planet. And so, you know, we, we, have, we have all the good ideas that we need. It's a question of do we have the, the you know, do we have the, the willpower to insist that our, that our leaders do it? And if these leaders aren't going to do it, are we going to, um, you know, bring some leaders in who, who can and who will? Yeah, there's some interesting conversation happening on the chat line, um, Anami, and one, uh, one comment about long-term care I want to comment on if I can, and another one Andy Shadrach posted about oversimplifying the fault lines of racism. And I know there's a lot of complexity to get at there, but I do know that we, you know, it, um, we know that uh, the police forces, unfortunately, it's clear to me, 
cannot pretend that we don't have a very large problem. What I said in my speech, so I'll just cut to the chase on this, is that um, if, there's all, if there's one thing scarier than a white supremacist with a gun, it's a white supremacist with a gun in uniform. I really think we have to pay attention to that as a, as a it's, you know, in terms of what can you do if you say, okay, I'm in political life, what can I do? I'm going to keep fighting for number one. We've got to get rid of carding. We've got to get rid of racial profiling. We have to actually get, we have to examine our police and our military and make sure that they are not members of other organiza of organizations with a white supremacist goal, that they don't have a Nazi tattoo somewhere on their arm. These are not far-fetched scenarios. They are real. I, th I think back to, I mean, with the shooting that just happened in Edmondson, I was talking to Jenica at when we, of course, we were all very, very absorbed as MPs with what we can do. But it wasn't that long ago that in Elsa Buktuk, the RCMP took down a peaceful protest by Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Pasmaquoddy people in a peaceful protest against fracking, uh, where the only, the only political party associated with that effort was, of course, the Greens. David Kuhn wasn't elected at that time, but was standing in solidarity with that. But what was on the front page of the Global Mail was a police car on fire. And the other part of this I want to mention is agent provocateurs uh, Paul Manley is the, one of Canada's resident experts on agent provocateurs. So for those who may, I think pretty savvy crowd we're talking to tonight, but um, the notion that police forces and security forces uh, or also we'll throw in black bloc and anarchists, you get, you do get some people who have another agenda, but nonviolent protest is essential. Protests must remain nonviolent. But it's in the interests of the state and it's in the interests of fascism and it's in the interests of crackdowns that there be people in crowds who incite violence or do violence. And we saw it this week in Minneapolis where pro legitimate protesters said, who's that guy who's shown up with the hammers, who's prepared to take down all that uh, boarding? If you want to know Paul's history on this, it's absolutely astonishing. I think I think everybody would know that Paul Manley was a filmmaker for many years before he became um, an, a member of parliament. He's the filmmaker. Some of you may remember this when there was a, a protest against the Security and Prosperity Partnership at Montebello in Quebec. And I, mean, I should look for heads nodding. I should change my screen and see if I see heads nodding. But there was that big SPP protest at Montebello. It wasn't that big, actually, in terms of the number of people. But in that protest, um, there were some guys who wanted to throw rocks. And they weren't listening to the protest organizers that said, put down your rocks. And finally, they realized at the, the organizer turned to the camera and Paul was filming all this with his camera. And the organizer said, those are cops. <laughs> because it, it was so clear, they weren't listening, they weren't putting down their rocks, they were wearing masks. The other tip off, if you're, if you're ever in a demonstration, it, the typical crowd of demonstrators of Greens and people for social justice, we're kind of, we're kind of, um, kind of, well, we're not, we're not built, right? We're not like muscle men. We're kind of a, we're kind of your vegan crowd. We're kind of willowy. Um, these guys were hunky, built up. And a friend of mine spotted the same thing at the WTO in Quebec City one year. We said, oh my God, um, that's definitely, those guys look like soldiers, but they're pretending to be demonstrators. Anyway, these guys, Paul pulled down their mask. Paul took enough footage that they were able to prove these guys were still at Quebec because when they were finally, they had to have a fake arrest to get them out of the crowd because they'd been identified as cops. <laughs> so anyway, the bottom of the soles of their boots, a six, six boots, three pairs of boots, identical soles, uh, a particular model only sold to the sale at Quebec. So I know I'm getting way off topic and I should move to the Dutch auction. But I think we need to be, as Greens, we can say things other politicians aren't going to say. We can say things other people aren't going to say, which is the reason there's more anti-Semitism, the reason there's more anti-Black racism, the reason there's anti-Asian racism, the reason that anti-Indigenous racism doesn't go away. And there's a reason that the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry found that victims of violence and sexual violence within the Indigenous community 
often didn't go to the RCMP because the RCMP have been perpetrators. So there's a whole, there's a whole narrative here where things kind of interlink. And I think we have to raise it up and say, post pandemic, uh, no more man camps. That's one of the things missing and murdered indigenous women and girls inquiry said, okay, we're gonna pay attention to that. As Anime said, pandemic, that doesn't stop them from building pipelines. Well, it should. And we're looking at protecting life, keeping people safe, and keeping people safe regardless of the color of your skin, which means you have to keep everybody safe from racist cops. So it's a, it, there, there's lots of wonderful policemen out there. And one of them, I think, is on this call. I think, Heather, I think, uh, I'm not going to say your name, uh, but I think, um, I think, I think Paul's sister's on this call. And she was, uh, she was a police officer. There's a lot of wonderful police out there but we have to root out the ones that join the police force so they can be that person that gets to do the horrific things that we're seeing because the way in which George Floyd was killed, the, 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 the callousness, the, deli the deliberate <sighs> evil of it, that just doesn't happen overnight. So I think we need to, to, to try to do uh, uh, to yeah. really be good allies and anime thank can you i just say running yes. for the green party for leadership i think you mm -hmm. help the whole diversity of our leadership race is important for us anyway yes. sorry anime you take it away. no no that's a perfect segue it's a perfect segue because it's difficult and i actually was going to say it earlier uh, and then i said no but i am going to say it because it is really important um for two reasons one because of what you said which is that you know, I joined the Green Party because I know for a fact there is no party that is going to say the things that we say, um, that is going to propose the policies that, that we have proposed. And uh, when, you know, given what we've been talking about tonight, we more than ever are needed. You know, we are needed at the table where these decisions are going to be happening about the recovery, you know, who is going to benefit, who, you know, what, what, um, transformational structural changes we're going to make. Uh, and so we are absolutely needed there, right? Um, I, my concern, um, Elizabeth, is that we, you know, need to make sure that we are not creating barriers to our participation and to having Canadians vote for us. And one of the barriers that we have, the most important one in my mind, and again, is very topical, is our lack of diversity. Um, we ran a less diverse slate of candidates in the last election than even the People's Party of Canada. Uh, and so this is, this is, and this has been the case from the beginning with the Green Party. We don't want to become, you know, also accused of what I think we rightly can accuse other parties of, which is really just talking the talk, you know, and not doing the work. And so given how important it is to have us there in these discussions on behalf of peoples in Canada, on behalf of marginalized peoples and all people in Canada, we have got to do the work um, to diversify our party. We have got to bring in these voices. It's going to create better public policy. It's going to create better policy for the Green Party internally. And it is going to help us to create a credible path to victory. There is no way that we can increase our seats in the house if we do not diversify our party and so you know we also need to look at ourselves and stop saying we're going to do it we're going to do it soon 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 and just actually do it all of the information we need is there all of the action items exist um, we must do this uh, as as the, as the top priority